Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. I wanted to do something a little bit different on the channel today, but before I get started, I just wanted to talk briefly about the pronunciation of the name of H.P. Lovecraft's most famous seabound entity. The true way to say that being's name is, as closely as I can manage it anyway, Kalalhalu. That's really hard to say, especially repeatedly through a video like this one, so I will be using the pronunciation I more commonly fall back on, Kahulu. Right, let's get started. It's no great secret that I am a fan of the works of H.P. Lovecraft, as well as the derivative works of countless other writers and filmmakers. It's why I have this really rather lovely book on my shelf. Lovecraft's works aren't always easy reading, but there are compelling themes and ideas wrapped up in his rather bloated prose. And I'm clearly not the only person who enjoys these works, which is why board game designers and publishers frequently draw from the well of the Kahulu mythos to add narrative structure and purpose to their games. I have to admit, while I tend to roll my eyes a bit when I see yet another Lovecraft-inspired game coming to retail, or more likely Kickstarter, I still get that little frisson of excitement to see a new attempt to breathe life into the horrific creatures and settings I enjoy so much. Over the years I have played a few different Lovecraft-themed board games, and more often than not those games have come from the stable of Fantasy Flight games. Arkham Horror was actually the first big box game I purchased when I was getting back into board games after an extended absence. I had been mainly picking up small two-player games to play with my future wife, but when I heard about Arkham Horror, I fell in love with the idea and pre-ordered it immediately. And it is a great game, a tense and interesting challenge with plenty of moving parts to ensure each game throws something new at you. I don't play it very often, so infrequently in fact I've never even purchased a single expansion for it, but it's always a good time when it hits the table. The game touches on so many themes from the stories and does a wonderful job of giving you the tools and time to develop a character who feels like a protagonist you care about. Nevertheless, for me it never truly captured the mystery and horror of the mythos in any kind of meaningful way. When a nun is riding around town on a motorcycle, shooting shuggoths with a tommy gun, you really are only using Lovecraft as a jumping off point for something entirely more camp. And I've never even considered buying the newer edition of Arkham Horror or the globe-spanning Eldritch Horror. The second Mythos game I tried from FFG was Call of Cthulhu the Collectible Card Game, which was eventually reinvented as a living card game. I never really got into it, it felt very mechanical, as so many card games do I suppose, and the head-to-head -head conflict between players made it hard for me to engage with the theme. It was very solid as a game, but not the experience I was looking for. Mansions of Madness seemed like a better fit for the intellectual property, a heavily narrative-based game with mysteries to solve and places to explore. When I bought the first edition, it was love at first bite, and I really enjoyed it for the first half dozen plays. But the shine wore off quickly. It was a pain to set up, and the rules were just too fiddly for what I got out of the game. It was fun to see stories develop, but the whole thing needed to be cleaner. I suspect the second edition that used an app to run the scenarios resolved some of those complaints, but I'm never front of the queue for an app-based game, and I felt by that point I had played enough Mansions of Madness anyway. Then there was Elder Sign, a dice chucker where you had to match symbols on cards with custom dice. I found it a bit boring, and I don't think it ever brought the theme to life for me. And while I always wanted to try the Arkham Horror card game, I just never got around to it. But there was one thing all of these games had in common. They all had really nice artwork. In many cases, the same artwork. FFG have an incredible portfolio of Lovecraft-inspired art to draw on excuse the pun, and for me it's usually a highlight of any of their board games, which is why I had to get this. I've had this book since it came out all the way back in 2006, The Art of H.P. Lovecraft's Kahulu Mythos. It's a really lovely, beautifully produced hardback book, edited by Pat Harrington and Brian Wood, and containing a hefty selection of FFG's art, plus a few classic pieces of line art from Chaosium's catalogue. It weighs in at 192 pages and features the work of dozens of different artists, all using their own unique styles to capture facets of the Cthulhu mythos, from great old ones to esoteric texts, and from alien worlds to the far more human criminal underworld. Unfortunately, the book's out of print now. I've only found a few copies on eBay and Amazon, ranging from around £70 to £130, and I cannot stress enough, this book isn't worth that much. But if you happen to find a copy in an old bookshop or charity store for a decent amount, I would consider grabbing it when you have the chance. For fans of FFG's games, few pieces of art in the book are going to be new. 
it's mostly stuff that was used in the collectible card game, but it's nice to see the art on a larger canvas, with some pieces spreading luxuriously across a double page, while other pieces get blown up from a tiny piece of card art to the size when all the glorious and grim little details have room to breathe. It's also a joy to have all this art in one place, in a single book you can sit back and flick through with a coffee, contemplating the horrors that await us beyond the stars. One of my favourite things about this art is its ability to more accurately convey Lovecraft's ideas compared to plastic miniatures you might find in a game like Death May Die from Cool Mini or not. The whole point of the mythos is these creatures are beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. They don't fit within the framework of earthly geometry and human constructs. Art has the opportunity to obscure details, to present the terrible hint of something monstrous just below the surface, and it's when this book brings that kind of image to the fore that it truly excels. Unfortunately, quite a bit of the artwork in the book is workmanlike, almost mundane. These are images created for games, so they often exist only as a visual depiction of some character or artifact. The book contains many images of mobsters, smoke-wreathed professors, and mysterious trilby-wearing gentlemen in foggy parks. But interspersed between those images, you have the real gems. Alien vistas that recede into the incomprehensible vastness of space, entities lurking in dark alleys, or a shadow at a lit doorway. Hints of something otherworldly. Yes, there is a tendency for the artist to slap a few tentacles on something and go, ooh, Lovecraftian, but I think that's a reflection of FFG's philosophy behind the games this art was created for. But there are pieces of art here that make you think, this artist gets it. An alien sky, a shadowy deity towering above a distant sea. A monstrous creature created from brush strokes that obscure as much as they illuminate. A clock disintegrating in the way an investigator's sanity might disintegrate on coming to learn the truth that time is an artificial construct only loosely binding the true chaos of reality. These are the images that capture the true essence of Lovecraft. These are the images that linger long after you close the book and return it to the shelf. The images that could have been the work of Richard Pickman himself. But that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really like this video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.